pleased to say that I'm joined by Georgina Wright from the Institute for Government and the Conservative MP George Freeman. George, it's good to see you. Let me just get some reaction to you first. Can I read you a, a tweet from Laura Koonsberg, our political editor, who says a former cabinet minister shares what he has messaged to the chief whip tonight to state the obvious, he says, if ministers who felt unable to support government on a three-line whip are allowed to remain in place, you will have no way to persuade any colleagues to ever support future three-line whips. Twelve cabinet secretaries and ministers who did not go with the government tonight. Yeah, collective responsibility was suspended two and a half years ago for the referendum and it's never been restored. I'm afraid that was one of the implications of the Brexit revolution. And more's the pity, it's basically robbed this country of proper and effective government. And that's why we've got to get through this, find a Brexit deal that can get through the House and get back to proper, effective government. OK, well, let's start there. Tomorrow there will be a vote to delay and... I would presume that there will be indicative votes attached to that. So what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, look, I think it's very important for your viewers to understand what's happened in the last 24 hours. Firstly, last night, Parliament voted against the Prime Minister's deal. I, mean, I was a Remainer. I went to vote for it. I'm happily voting for Brexit. I was abandoned by hardcore Conservative Brexiteers who joined Benite, Hard Left, SNP, Second Refers and Anti-Brexiteers. You couldn't make it up. And I'm afraid the Prime Minister's deal is now dead. And tonight, Parliament said, and we're not prepared to crash out in two weeks, which is what some of the rebels last night wanted. There is a majority in this House for a sensible Brexit. There are at least 100 Labour MPs in northern Brexit voting constituencies who provided uh, they can show that the government is humiliated enough for them as opposition MPs to hold their noses, they will vote for Brexit. And I am absolutely committed to finding a Brexit deal that can get through. So to pin you on that, you are talking about Norway Plus, a customs union. No, um, EFTA and EEA, the European Free Trade Area, uh, EFTA is not a customs union. Right. Um, so we, if you're in EFTA, you're in the single market, right. not in the customs union, free to do trade deals, not subject to the European but Court of Justice. But it's Norway Plus. Well, the, the <laughs> issue that, is... That, what the will plus Labour is to keep the border in Ireland open. That's where the customs union comes in. Well, the issue is what will Labour MPs demand as their price for supporting it? Now, for me, the attraction of EFTA is that it's not a customs union. It's a very close customs partnership. It gives us the alignment to sell goods into the European single market, but also the freedom to trade internationally. That, I think, is the central gravity in this country. Most of my Leave voters said, George, I want to be in a common market, not a political union. Two-tier Europe. Yeah, the problem with it is that it requires single... It requires free movement, uh, and that's the traditional complaint. And my counter to that is it's free movement of workers, not citizens. Uh, we would need to do two key things. Major welfare reform to stop welfare tourism. Migrants getting a job and sending the housing benefit back to Poland. And secondly, we'd have to put in place a big skills package, I think, for our blue-collar voters feeling abandoned uh, to technology and globalisation. Two things I'd like to do anyway. That's really interesting. Interesting detail. Is it an indicative vote, though, when the Prime Minister's made it clear today she wants meaningful vote three, and there are some ERGers who are suggesting tonight that they would hold their nose and vote for that deal, as opposed to what you just set out? So I think if the Prime Minister had done what I and others asked and have a first vote in December, second in January, third at the beginning of Feb, we'd be on vote five now and we'd get down to a majority of about 15. But that's not what's happened. We're two weeks out. The deal was defeated by 150 last night. I think the Prime Minister's deal is dead and the House now wants to and should be given a chance to okay. define a plan B. OK, Georgina, let me bring you in because the Commission is putting out statements tonight it doesn't think Theresa May's deal is dead. It is saying it is either that deal or, what, revoking Article 50. And that's what they will try and tie to any short extension. So what we've heard uh, tonight is that they've said very plainly the a vote against no deal doesn't take no deal off the table. That's correct. The only way to take no deal off the table is either to accept some form of, of deal or to revoke Article 50 and stop the process altogether. And those are the two options. At the moment, there is a deal on the table. Parliament has rejected it. There doesn't seem to be enough will to revoke Article 50 and stop the process altogether. So they're looking and saying, well, what are you going to do? Would they be disposed to what George has just set out? Does the withdrawal agreement stop what George has just set out? I mean, effectively, you could pass the withdrawal agreement and still get that. No, it doesn't. That's right. And as late as September, uh, uh, Mr Tusk, said, listen, we offered you originally a Canada free trade agreement or a Norway 
Uh, but the candidate was only for Great Britain. It wouldn't have brought right. Ireland with but it. But as late as September, he was signalling, you, Britain, decided to go down this slightly weird path of having your own bespoke deal. We offered you Norway or Canada. So uh, my information, intelligence, instinct is that Europe doesn't want to no deal either. And if they think there's a serious chance of this house finding a sensible plan B, it'll give us the time to do it. I mean, they've certainly indicated, haven't they? They said uh, if the government changed its red line, so if, for example, the government's position changed and said, do you know what, actually, we want an EFTA-style agreement, then there might be flexibility in that withdrawal mm. agreement and there might be scope for it. But at the moment, because of the government's red line, we, don't want, we want to leave the single market, we want to leave the customs union, we want to end freedom of movement. They're saying, well, we've gone as far as we can and now the ball is in your court. In mind of what you're setting out, the Prime Minister, if she followed your advice and mm -hmm. went for this deal, she would lose a fair chunk of her party who would be opposed to that. She'd have to break, breach one of her red lines, yeah, and she would lose some Conservatives. My point is, last night they demonstrated they're not with her anyway, so we're going to have to deliver a Brexit without them, a cross-party Brexit. I think the British public want us to, to exercise some political uh, wit and manoeuvrability and compromise to find a Brexit deal. Yeah. But the point I was coming to is that once you've agreed the deal, you have to pass the legislation for it. That means that the Prime Minister would have to put an enormous amount of trust in the opposition. So do you pass the deal and then inevitably go for a general election? Well, I think I mean, a general election is coming. It's quite difficult to see how a government with a majority of eight that is rapidly disappearing... And no three-line whip. <laughs> well, and we lost three MPs last week. Uh, we lost 30 MPs in the 2017 election. Uh, this is only going in one direction and I think we need to start to begin to prepare for that reset moment mm. and I worry at the moment a Conservative Party which looks like it's relishing no deal mm. uh, hasn't got the wit to find a deal will it look like it's in danger of defying the public vote for Brexit and proving itself incompetent to finding a solution but the point just, just uh, because I want to get your thoughts on this and saying the point you're saying is that the solution you have just offered that could be done within a short time span you wouldn't need a long delay you could do that within two months yes I think right. the Prime Minister will be signaling tomorrow a three-month extension EFTA have already said that uh, the EFTA nations have said we'd be very happy to have Britain in if that's uh, where the British Prime Minister is up yeah. for us going and we're already in the EA which is the it's yeah. the complex, it's the legal bit that would give us access to the single market. Yeah. So it's perfectly doable. Okay. Unlike the Malthouse Compromise, which requires the complete deconstruction of the deal, uh, it's, it's the obvious off-the-shelf mm. solution that best matches what the British public wants. This will sound eminently sensible to soft Brexiteers and maybe some Remainers who want to uphold the referendum result, but it will be abhorrent to people like Nigel Farage, who would say this is not Brexit, this is staying very, very close to the European Union. He has said tonight in an interview with Andrew Neil on the BBC that he will be doing all he can to try and get one of these countries to veto the extension and they would only need one to, to veto it. So I, I, I caught uh, wind of that interview as well. I think you know we've got to place these negotiations in the broader context of what's going on in the EU right now. They are the different member states discussing how the budget, the uh, seven year budget is going to be spent. If Do we realistically think that an EU country would side with the UK and oppose all the others if it thought that that might in some way impact how much money it would be able to get along that big term and chunk uh, uh, over the coming years. I think that's, that's the problem, is that these um, negotiations aren't happening in a vacuum. There are lots of other internal negotiations going on and member states will be cautious about, yes, we will try and help the UK as much as possible, but it's unlikely that they would side with the UK and oppose everyone else because they might lose leverage elsewhere. How, how much longer can the chaos we've seen across the road continue? You might get through the softer Brexit that you've set out tonight, but there will be more defeats. Sarah Newton was the 15th member of the government mm. to have resigned mm. tonight. And I dare say, if you go to the country, there will be a lot of people who will blame the Conservative Party for this and will want to give the Conservative yes, Party that's my a worry. bloody nose. Uh, that is absolutely my worry, and it's why I begged colleagues yesterday to vote for this deal. I don't think it's perfect at all. I think it's got all sorts of weaknesses in it but it is a deal it would give us an orderly transition it would have taken us out of the European Union in a way that business could live with and I bitterly regret that colleagues voted against it I agree I think public patience is wearing very thin and at this rate it's quite clear we're gonna to have to have a general election long before 20 uh, and the Prime Minister 2022 
Well, I think it's also clear to everybody, including I think now the Prime Minister, that she is running out of road and running out of room to manoeuvre, goodwill, trust, all the skills you need to be able to negotiate. And I think she said last night to the House, I am your servant. Tell me where you, you want to go and I will do my best. And that is her last chance. Now it's up to Parliament and I'm absolutely committed to seeing whether we can't find a cross-party Brexit. If we can do that, I think the Prime Minister will be lauded as a hero in the nation for going beyond party, reaching out across party, one nation Brexit that links the northern Labour voters with the, those who voted to leave, but in a way that doesn't insult the 48%. A one-nation Conservative Brexit, not a UKIP Brexit. George Freeman, Conservative MP, thank you very much indeed for your candour this evening. Georgina Wright, thank you to you too as well. So another historic night here at the House of Commons in Westminster tonight. Uh, the government defeated again, another resignation. And tomorrow we go forward, of course, to the vote on a delay. You're watching a BBC News special.